favor of cameras. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Foreign Correspondence Club of Japan. May, uh, my name is Martin Kerling. I'm East Asia correspondent with the German Financial Daily Handelsblatt, and I'm the moderator of today. And it's my great pleasure to introduce a fellow European, um, Stefano Sanino. He is Secretary General of the Euro European Union's European External Action Service, service which is uh, kind of equivalent maybe to the foreign ministry in Japan. Maybe you can correct me on that. And a little bit of a defense <laughs> as well. <laughs> okay. Maybe this is where the external action comes from. Um, uh, yeah, it's a very timely event in my view. In, uh, the tensions in Europe are rising again now that Germany decided to uh, basically export Leopard tanks uh, to Ukraine. Yeah. Uh, there are yeah, more tensions to be expected in Europe. Yeah, the German uh, foreign minister uh, yesterday said that basically Germany is at war with Russia, um, which is a quite controversial remark in Germany. So, uh, And now, of course, the European Union also is involved in this matter, but also looks uh, increasingly to East Asia and the Indo-Pacific um, to increase its links uh, to like-minded countries in this region. As far as I understand, uh, Mr. Sanino is, was here not only to speak with the Japanese foreign ministry, but also to talk uh, with uh, re representatives uh, from four, four? four, uh, four uh, Asian and Oceanian nations, which are South Korea, Japan, uh, Australia, and New Zealand. And uh, this is a very interesting mix of countries that are talking together with the EU about uh, the um, situation in the Indo-Pacific. So without, uh, so yeah, Mr. S uh, St uh, Sanino was uh, previously um, Deputy Secretary General for Economic and Global Issues at the, the same organization, but originally is a diplomat from Italy, and he was ambassador uh, to Spain and Italian permanent representative to the EU before. Okay, uh, thank you very much for joining us today, and without further ado, I would like to open the floor yeah, to your speech, to your introductory, introductory remarks. Thank you very much, and if I may also, in a, um, an official of the uh, European Commission, and I'm also very proud of this double heading that, uh, that I have worked for uh, many years. So it's, um, I have a sort of embodying the two uh, souls of the uh, um, uh, of the European uh, uh, external projection. Um, uh, thank you very much for um, uh, joining uh, me this morning. Thanks uh, uh, for uh, uh, hosting me here. Um, essentially, I think that you uh, um, need to see uh, uh, this mission against the background of the new geopolitical landscape that uh, um, we are all facing. Uh, there is more and more uh, a, a situation uh, where the, the, the challenges that, that the world is facing have become uh, um, global. Um, if you think that the uh, security of, the, uh, um, uh, of our countries this is not something that you can uh, isolate and take in isolation. You have to see them uh, in a global perspective. Uh, um, uh, the, uh, on one hand, we have seen after the Russian aggression against Ukraine, the uh, reinsurgence of the uh, conventional uh, uh, threats. But uh, uh, alongside with this, we are also experiencing uh, many transnational and I would say transcontinental threats when it comes to cyber, when it comes to the instrumentalization of uh, uh, policies, when it comes to the challenges on the space or on the, uh, uh, the maritime challenges. And uh, the uh, security theater more and more has become one. Uh, and uh, again, I mean, from that point of view, 
um, it's, uh, uh, I think, uh, um, completely uh, um, overcome the division between uh, the different regions of the world, Europe, uh, Asia, uh, uh, Americas, because we are essentially all, uh, uh, again, as I was saying at the beginning, facing the same kind of, of challenges. Um, and that's why uh, there, there is for, uh, um, uh, we have decided to uh, uh, move much more boldly uh, in strengthening the uh, relations with the, uh, um, across the spectrum, um, and that in this case particularly with Japan. Japan is, uh, has been for a long time a key partner of uh, the European Union. Um, uh, in the last few years, we have gone through a number of important uh, and, uh, agreements, uh, the strategic partnership back in 2018, the economic partnership in the same year, but then the connectivity partnership, the Green Alliance, uh, the digital partnership, and uh, 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 Besides all that, there is also a lot of work that we are doing on the security uh, um, aspects when it comes to uh, um, uh, the maritime sector with the uh, uh, work on the critical maritime routes in the Indo-Pacific, um, the joint naval exercise in the uh, Indo-Pacific, uh, the project to enhance the cooperation in the security sector in Asia with the number of uh, exchanging among experts, the work that we are doing together in uh, the space sector, uh, in uh, this information. All this to say that the, uh, there is a very rich basis on which we are uh, uh, building and strengthening the, uh, um, uh, our common work, but we want to uh, move, let's say, even further in uh, uh, this cooperation, especially, again, in this new uh, um, complex and challenging uh, um, uh, geopolitical landscape. Um, uh, Japan is uh, um, holding out the presidency of the uh, G7. Uh, it's uh, starting uh, its two years term uh, in the UN Security Council. So also from that point of view, it becomes uh, central in uh, the uh, um, uh, global strategies that we will need to develop. And uh, uh, it is interesting also to see, which is the focus on uh, the work in the context of the uh, G7, and I would highlight in particular the issue of economic security, but also the projection uh, um, um, towards third countries. Um, uh, there is a, a part of the bilateral dimension. There is also a very important uh, regional dimension. Um, uh, the European Union has uh, 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 developed a Indo-Pacific strategy um, uh, last year, and we are now rolling out and implementing this strategy. This is also very much in line with the work of, the, of, the, of Japan on the free and open Indo-Pacific, um, and there are a lot of uh, um, common elements from that point of view. And uh, um, it is also in this context, uh, as it has been mentioned, that we uh, have agreed to have also a part of the bilateral consultations, also a, a first meeting uh, with the colleagues, uh, uh, not only of Japan, but also of uh, South Korea, Australia, uh, and New Zealand, sharing again the same uh, uh, preoccupations for the uh, um, uh, perspective of the security in, uh, in this region. Um, um, last point that I would like to uh, uh, mention is that the, uh, uh, we have seen also with great interest the new uh, uh, strategies, the uh, uh, national security strategy, the, the, the uh, uh, defense, um, um, the national defense strategy um, that are uh, uh, projecting Japan very much into even more active uh, um, external dimension, and that's, I would say, uh, uh, also uh, it's very much in line with the work that we are doing in, uh, in, uh, in the European Union, and I would refer in this uh, uh, context to the strategic compass, which is the new sec security doctrine that we uh, have developed uh, um, uh, last year, and that we are also uh, rolling out in, in this period. So a lot of convergence, uh, a uh, lot of common work, um, and uh, this is true at the governmental level, but I would like to mention also the contacts that I'm having with the representative of civil society, uh, both with the, the uh, uh, 
the think tank community, the universities, but also with the uh, uh, representatives of civil society dealing with gender issues and LGBTIQ plus uh, uh, issues. So uh, it is very, it has been a very rich program and still has a, a half day to, uh, uh, to go and today they have a number of, still a number of meetings, but very fruitful that are giving the sense of the uh, um, uh, common sense of purpose that we have with Japan and on which we want to build uh, the future of our relations. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, before I open the floor to questions, uh, I would uh, like to ask uh, one question myself. Um, could you expand a little bit more uh, on the, this uh, yeah, meeting with South Korea, Japan, uh, Australia, and uh, New Zealand? Is this a new format, or is it just by chance? What, is the, what are the reasons for the choice of these uh, partners? And do you think that this will become a more permanent fixture in your diplomatic schedule? Do you want me to uh, answer? Me? Yes. Okay. Um, it's a, I would say it's a relatively uh, um, a new format uh, uh, in the sense that we have not had before in uh, this context. We had bilaterally at the European Union with all these countries very uh, uh, developed partnership. Um, but we wanted to, uh, um, I thought, we thought it would be interesting to, uh, um, uh, let's say, to check our common agenda, uh, the way we are assessing uh, uh, the uh, challenges that we have in the region and beyond, and how we could uh, um, work more uh, uh, together to, uh, to face these challenges. Um, uh, the reason, I would say, it's quite evident, uh, um, the security of our countries is become much more fragile. And again, the uh, um, aggression against Ukraine is showing this uh, in a very graphic way. And the risks of potential uh, um, um, complex situations uh, and how we can face this uh, um, together. Um, we share the interest of uh, uh, defending a, a rules-based uh, international order um, and we would like to uh, make sure that all the countries uh, abide by this rule that we have agreed among ourselves um, and to which we are all have agreed to abide by. Um, uh, we will continue working in this uh, context, in this format. Um, we will try to uh, give even some more substance. Um, we have identified a number of potential areas of cooperation, so we will see uh, uh, if this is developing into a, a, a let's say, a substantial uh, um, uh, architecture uh, that can bring us together in areas of uh, common interest. I'm, I'm thinking about. Uh, uh, digital, I'm thinking about uh, uh, cyber and, and about other areas where, uh, uh, as I said, connectivity, where we have uh, common view and common perception of how to uh, move our agenda forward. Mm -hmm. So uh, when can we see whether there will be more results? I mean, uh, we started yesterday, so uh, we will work on that. I mean, we will see, I mean, we have uh, agreed to uh, um, define more uh, uh, specific agenda. We have identified a number of areas, some of those that I have uh, uh, mentioned now, and we will have our, uh, let's say, experts working on, uh, on this, and we have committed to uh, meet again, uh, uh, possibly physically, uh, in the coming months. Oh, so it's moving. Okay. Okay, then uh, I will open the floor to questions, to journalists first. Any questions from journalists here in the room? Yeah, please come to the microphone and identify yourself by name and affiliation. And you can ask as many questions as you wish. <laughs> <laughs> We're not so many here today. Well, my name is Shoichiro Taguchi from Nikkei. Very nice to meet you. 
Um, I have a question regarding the uh, situation in Ukraine. So, um, regarding the latest developments in arms supplies to Ukraine, um, mainly from the U.S. and European countries, do you think the level of the military support from the West have moved to the next stage um, amid the wars into into its second year? Um, will this be will this be a key um, to put enough pressure on Russia? Um, um, we have had since the very beginning of, uh, of the war, uh, um, uh, we have felt the, uh, the need to uh, uh, support Ukraine against this aggression. Um, I, mean, I don't want to uh, repeat the f standard formula, but uh, uh, it is true that it is uh, an aggression which is completely unjustified and ungrounded. Um, and we have seen it as uh, not only an aggression in its, in, in its own character, but also as, a, uh, um, again, as a violation of the uh, international order that we have given ourselves uh, for the last uh, um, uh, 70 years. Um, I think that uh, this latest development in terms of arms supply is just a, an evolution of the uh, um, situation and of the uh, um, uh, way Russia has started uh, uh, moving the war into a different uh, um, stage. I mean, the uh, uh, indiscriminate attacks against uh, um, civilians uh, and against cities, um, so it's no longer uh, uh, military targets, it's no longer critical infrastructures, now it's targeting uh, uh, cities, uh, people, uh, uh, citizens, and that's, I mean, uh, um, it's just uh, giving uh, the uh, possibility to the Ukrainians to defend themselves against uh, this. So for me, it's not moving the war at a different stage. It's just giving the possibility of saving uh, lives and allowing the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Ukrainians to defend from uh, these uh, uh, barbaric attacks. So um, what, what about the, um, how, how do you think about the delay or um, kind of hesitation in Germany's decision in the process of deciding to provide Leopard 2. Um, I suppose the U.S. was also initially cautious about um, providing tanks, but why, why do you think that the countries raised the level of the armed provisions here, and how, how, does, um, how would you, uh, EU respond to this movement? Well, as I was saying, I mean, uh, this is not that we have decided to uh, um, uh, raise the level. It has been Russia that has decided to uh, move the war into a, a, a dimension that is going beyond the uh, uh, purely military targets. And uh, uh, from that point of view, it was evident that the uh, uh, support that uh, uh, Ukraine had been given was not sufficient to uh, uh, allow them to uh, uh, defend themselves from uh, uh, these attacks. Uh, whenever you take this kind of decisions, uh, there is always, let's say, a normal degree of caution about uh, uh, doing uh, and taking these decisions. I think it's, uh, um, uh, it's responsible to uh, uh, think about, uh, about this. But I, I also have a very clear sense uh, that within European Union there is a determination to uh, uh, support Ukraine, as we say, as much and as long as needed. Mm -hmm. um, we cannot accept that uh, this aggression uh, uh, can prevail over the uh, um, rights of the uh, uh, of free country to preserve its own independence and territorial integrity. My last question regarding the Ukraine's accession to the EU membership. So Ukraine applied for the EU membership in February 2022 and was granted EU candidate status in um, June last year. So the Council has said that um, it will decide on further steps once Ukraine fulfill uh, the condition outlined in the European Commission's opinion. Um, so do you see any progress regarding Ukraine's accession? Um, in what ways do you think um, improvements are still needed, um, such as in the development of a market economy in Ukraine. Um, yes, this has been a very important decision, uh, um, uh, and uh, it has been taken uh, uh, with, uh, um, I would 
would say, with the clear sense of the implications of, uh, uh, of this decision. We wanted to provide uh, uh, Ukraine the sense that they are, uh, the door to the European Union is open. It's what they have always uh, looked for. At the end of the day, the war started much more for this than for any other consideration. The idea of having a country that would move <coughs> steadily towards the uh, um, uh, European integration and to uh, be um, an open uh, and integrated economy with the, uh, with the, uh, the European Union. There are a number of, uh, the, the uh, in, uh, enlargement process is, a, as we say, a merit-based process. So you need to uh, comply with a certain number of uh, rules. There is a political decision, and that's the one that has been taken. But then there is a technical uh, process because you need to integrate into a community of law. Uh, uh, and, and hence, you need to be uh, ready to uh, um, uh, accept and introduce in the legislation the uh, European uh, uh, component. Um, that's why we have identified a number of areas uh, with which, uh, in which um, Ukraine needs to work. And I have to say that it is quite striking that uh, in spite of the circumstances and of the, uh, um, uh, the war that is ravaging the country, uh, uh, they have been extremely uh, uh, committed and very fast in starting working on this agenda. And there are uh, areas where they have already uh, uh, produced some very uh, concrete, concrete improvements, I'm thinking in particular to the justice sector. Um, this does not mean that the work is completed. Uh, there is an adaptation of the uh, uh, legal system, of the economic system that needs to be uh, uh, implemented. And um, we will continue working, uh, working together. Um, uh, but I think that, the, uh, again, the uh, political signal is clear, and the commitment of the Ukrainian authorities is also very clear and that's bonds well for the future. Um, any enlargement process is a process which is based on the commitment of the country. It's not just a commitment of uh, one institution, of one government, because it's a long-term process, and hence you need to have the whole society backing it. And once you have it, uh, as uh, we see it happening in Ukraine, the process uh, uh, can move much more uh, um, steadily uh, uh, than when societies are more uh, uncertain about their, their uh, uh, future uh, positioning. Mm -hmm. So I'm confident that this will, uh, will happen uh, and will happen uh, rapidly. Thank you. Uh, rapidly means in terms of accession? It's, uh, it's not, I mean, I'm saying rapidly, uh, uh, because as I say, I mean, uh, if you look at the other enlargement processes, the problem uh, starts when uh, uh, you have uh, a lack of agreement within the political spectrum. And then you have, uh, um, let's say, uh, going back and forward. I mean, and the, uh, uh, but if you have a linear process where you are adjusting, it takes the time that it takes, because as I said, it's not a, a only a political decision. The political decision is the first step, but then it's a, a technical work that needs to be done, and you need to uh, adjust the legislation to provide a track record, and that takes time. So it's a question of uh, years, not months, mm. but once the direction is clear and you commit, then I mean, it can be uh, more uh, more rapid than in many other cases. <laughs> so, according to recollection, was, was, uh, what was the fastest process? It's difficult to say because, I mean, the, uh, we have had different waves of enlargement, and over time, the concept of enlargement has changed. I mean, the fastest process was the uh, um, um, enlargement that brought in, uh, uh, let's say, the, 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 the countries of Central and Eastern Europe which was a process which was, let's say, done rapidly. Uh, but then progressively we saw that uh, this, this, the rapidity uh, was against the effectiveness and it was creating tensions in uh, these countries uh, because of their capacity to, uh, let's say, uh, stand the impact of the uh, European legislation of opening the economies, of liberalizing, of not having um, um, 
United States aids, which was supporting the economy and so on. So we have tried to uh, uh, create a, a path which is maybe a little bit longer, but then can allow the countries, once they are in, to avoid problems in, uh, uh, let's say, for their own uh, uh, progress in the mm. European Union. And um, so the process has become longer, but more effective. Mm. Thank you. Uh, I would also like to come back to uh, the Ukraine war. You mentioned that the EU uh, will support Ukraine, uh, will lend as much support as needed and as long as it's needed. Um, for what goals? So what are basically who decide what is when the need is basically fulfilled and uh, what are the goals that you uh, think uh, should be pursued? Well, I think that the goal is very evident. It's not to allow the Russian aggression to succeed. Um, uh, we have uh, been supporting Ukraine uh, uh, because we believe that this aggression is, uh, again, is completely unjustified. Um, um, and hence, uh, as long as this aggression lasts, then we will continue supporting Ukraine. Yeah. In the borders of when? That's, I mean, you have to ask uh, Mr. Putin when he wants to stop it. Hmm. And, But, uh, I mean, uh, the, there are always talks about a, a possible uh, um, solution by negotiation. Um. But um, it's, this is a, a, a question that is coming uh, back regularly. I mean, uh, the, uh, uh, President Zelensky has presented a 10 uh, um, points peace plan where he's identifying a number of uh, elements for uh, peace to, uh, uh, to take place. And one of these points, which I think is the basic one, is the uh, uh, withdrawal of the troops uh, uh, from Ukraine and the recognition of Ukraine in its territorial integrity. And that's the, uh, the basic point. The point is uh, not having uh, a peace which uh, is a capitulation. The problem is having a just and a durable peace mm -hmm. which is respecting the rights of a sovereign country. Because otherwise, I mean, uh, we are rewarding aggression and we are opening uh, and giving an example to other countries that could think that they can do whatever they want because at the end of the day they can along with it just because they have the strength to do that. So the international community is mobilized to show that aggression does not pay. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, this is another follow-up just to clarify a few issues you brought up. Um, You mentioned that uh, this is the basically um, the delivery of tanks is an evolution, but isn't it also a new quality? I mean, tank is not necessarily a defensive weapon against drone strikes. Um, they might be used for more offense, uh, offensive actions. So don't you think that this also means a new a real new stage, uh, not only in EU support, but also from the Russian side, that the Russian side sees this as a new stage. Once again, I'm, I'm sorry, but mm. it's the other way around. It looks like that, uh, uh, I would say, now mm. the defender is the attacker mm. and the attacker is the defender. So we are getting things wrong, I mean, in the, in the sequence. Um, um, Putin has moved from a concept of special operation mm. to a concept now of a war against NATO and the West. And he has moved from a concept of having a number of a limited number of troops, limited up to a point, but it's a limited number of troops, to a special mobilization, and now essentially is put in the ground of a general mobilization. He's bringing into the picture 300,000 people in a sort of a, a, a meat grinder. I mean, that's, this is the, 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 that's the new reality with, that we are facing. It's not that, I'll say, uh, it's only drones. I mean, he's bringing on the ground hundreds of thousands of poor young uh, boys and girls that know nothing about the war. And that's the, I'll say, uh, the way to defend from uh, this new uh, evolution. Once again, the, the evolution, it's not the evolution of the war. This is the response to the decision that even he himself had to, in his narrative, to change his initial narrative. So we are not speaking anymore about special operation to free up a country from a Nazi uh, leadership. Now we are speaking about a war with, uh, with NATO and with the West. 
different story. Hmm. I understand. So, another question about Europe. Sorry. <laughs> from <It's okay. laughs> I'm here for that. <laughs> um, from Anthony Rowley. Um, uh, he quotes a headline that the public opinion in Britain appears to be swinging against Brexit. In the event uh, that Britain were to ask uh, re-entry to the European Union, or at least some closer relationship, what uh, would be the reaction in Brussels? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that I'd say uh, um, we need to uh, 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 go step by step in, in this process. I think that uh, uh, what is important at this stage is to uh, uh, solve the issues that we have still open on the table in uh, the uh, different files, especially when it comes to the way um, we deal with Northern Ireland and the relationship between Northern Ireland and Ireland. So it's, uh, um, uh, and that's where we are focusing a lot of our work and of our energy. And I think that the, uh, um, uh, this new uh, um, government in the UK is uh, uh, taking uh, uh, steps that we uh, find positive in terms of providing concrete and uh, pragmatic solutions to, uh, um, uh, to all these issues. Uh, we have seen, and that's, um, I'm saying is in parallel to uh, this work, we have seen that especially during this uh, uh, last year, the uh, uh, cooperation with UK in a number of files has become very relevant, very strong. Uh, the work that we're doing in common uh, um, uh, when it, the reactions to the uh, uh, Russian aggression, uh, work on sanctions. Uh, we have seen, uh, again, a, a, a lot of interest in cooperation, uh, also in uh, very uh, um, sensitive sectors. Um, and that's also creating, a, uh, uh, let's say, an, a, an environment of closeness, of greater closeness between you and uh, UK. And I think that we need to keep in mind uh, that uh, uh, we share uh, the uh, same set of values, the same principle, uh, a very close vision of uh, uh, what to do uh, uh, together. So I would say I will uh, uh, stop there in terms of stock taking of what is happening in uh, uh, between the EU and UK. And then, I mean, uh, Let's see uh, how things are moving uh, in, in, in the future. Uh, I think it is important to uh, recreate uh, solid uh, links between uh, EU and UK, and then how this is going to be uh, um, uh, formalized. It's a decision of the, uh, uh, of the UK governments, and um, we will see. But it's Thank too you. early to go into a debate about the uh, re-entering of the UK <laughs> into European Union, But I think. It's safe to say that uh, the atmosphere of the talks and the relations has, has improved? It's safe to say this, yes. How much? I think it's, uh, um, it's, it's, moving, uh, it's moving in the right direction. <laughs> okay. Uh, other questions from the floor? Also uh, associate members, maybe? No, and then I have another question because you are in Japan. <laughs> yeah, I wonder a little bit about um, the relationship with Japan. Oh, I don't wonder, but I would like to know basically uh, what the state of the relations is and what uh, do you think the future holds in terms of diplomatic relations, but since you are also partly uh, basically the uh, defense ministry of Europe, it seems, if, of military relations. Look, I, um, I was trying to uh, give uh, in my introductory remarks uh, the sense of the uh, uh, depth and intensity of the relations between uh, uh, you and Japan. Um, and uh, I think that uh, from all points of view, Japan is a key partner of the European Union, like, um, uh, sharing uh, um, uh, vision, uh, regionally and, and globally. Um, I was mentioning different kind of uh, uh, 
partnerships in all these fields. When I speak about connectivity, uh, green, digital, uh, Japan has been the first third country to sign these partnerships and to develop these partnerships. Um, uh, we are working also on uh, the participation of Japan to um, um, Horizon Europe and to the um, uh, research area that we are developing. Which is Horizon Europe? Uh, Horizon Europe is the uh, research program of the European Union. We uh, bring together uh, researchers from uh, not only the European Union, but also from, uh, from third countries that are uh, uh, treated exactly in the same way as our own uh, uh, researchers, and we develop uh, um, uh, research projects together. Um, and it's one of the uh, most successful uh, um, uh, projects of the uh, European Union. You can ask Ambassador Perquet, who was in charge of this in his previous life incarnation. Um, and he has done a fantastic job to uh, uh, bring this project to uh, uh, new heights. Um, all this to say that there is a, a very solid ground in all these different areas. The, uh, strategic partnership, the uh, economic partnership, so all this is working, uh, um, uh, is working and we are rolling out plans to uh, uh, give much more substance to all this. But we are rightly speaking about the uh, um, uh, other, also other sectors. I think that, I mean, uh, uh, now uh, being from the, uh, in particular from the, uh, uh, from the European Union, I, I would focus more on the, the term security rather than defense, because when you speak about defense, you think much more about military aspects. And from that point of view, even if we are developing this, uh, uh, this dimension, and as I was saying, we are the foreign ministry of the European Union, but we are also the defense ministry of the European Union. Now, the concept of defense security, I think, over time has changed substantially. Um, uh, the uh, uh, conventional dimension has come to the fore significantly with the uh, uh, aggression against Ukraine, um, and that has taken, uh, uh, let's say, strength again. Um, but at, uh, in parallel with this, the concept of security is much broader and is covering a number of other sectors. Cyber security, uh, uh, um, uh, disinformation, manipulation of information, interferences, um, again, instrumentalization of policies, see what has happened with, the, uh, with energy or what had happened before with uh, Belarus, how was instrumentalized in migration. Um, which bringing us also to the issue of economic security and how to implement the uh, uh, economic security for, uh, for our countries, um, the uh, regulation of the uh, space uh, that is now, there is essentially it's a sort of uh, area which is not uh, uh, really properly uh, uh, regulated and it's of key importance because of the satellites. Um, the uh, uh, defense of the maritime routes for uh, our trade. So the concept has become much, much broader, but even uh, uh, the, the setting of standards and norms mm. and how this is done is uh, uh, determining uh, um, uh, our security. So from that point of view, the European Union in all these sectors is a key actor. Again, we are developing also the military dimension. I was mentioning the strategic compass. In the strategic compass, we are working among many things, but just to mention two of them, which I think are particularly uh, illustrative. One, the creation of uh, rapid deployment capabilities in order to intervene in areas of crisis uh, where NATO is not uh, capable, willing because of it, uh, to intervene. We have already uh, a number of 18 missions and operations uh, uh, around the world, both military and civilians, that are doing this in Africa mainly, but also in the, Bal in the Western Balkans or in the Middle East. And the other component is the, uh, uh, the capacity to fill the capabilities gap of our military industry. And from that point of view, we are uh, defining which are these gaps, and we have uh, created an instrument, the European Defence Fund, to uh, 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 help 
support our industry to uh, develop these capacities. But there is also another important uh, instrument that we have uh, um, uh, given ourselves, which is the uh, European Peace Facility which has been uh, the instrument through which we have supported the uh, uh, military su the supply of military equipment to uh, Ukraine. And it's not that much, I mean, I think it's quite relevant. We have now uh, three point, almost 3.7 billion uh, euro mobilized for uh, this purpose. But it's the, uh, apart the uh, uh, financial support, it's also the uh, uh, political signal that the European Union as a whole has taken responsibility in uh, this process, not leaving only a number of countries doing that. So also from that point of view, I think that uh, um, we are, uh, uh, let's say, an, an important actor in terms of security and defense, and we want to develop even stronger this dimension uh, with our uh, Japanese friends. Mm -hmm. Is Japan a special partner in this regard? If you look uh, at your other partners you're discussing with, I mean, I think of the joint fighter project with your home country, Italy, and the UK. Does this, uh, what does this uh, basically signify, this uh, joint venture project for the closeness of Japan and European security relations? I think that it's, a, it's an important project, but it's important, I mean, uh, more, more broadly speaking, the idea of First of all, of the integration in, uh, of, uh, uh, of our systems. I want to mention also the participation uh, and the, uh, the, the idea of Japan um, working more closely with NATO with a tailored uh, partnership program, which I think is another important um, uh, component. Again, it's the uh, integration, uh, uh, but uh, I think that be beyond that, um, it's the uh, uh, political assessment uh, that, uh, uh, on which all this work is based, political assessment that we share the same concerns mm -hmm. and that we share the feeling that we need to work together in order to uh, uh, face this, uh, these challenges. Mm -hmm. You talked about NATO. We had uh, the former uh, Japanese defense minister uh, Ishibashi Gelo uh, speaking here at the club. I think it was last week. And he mentioned NATO and even thought loudly about a distant possibility of Japan joining NATO. Um, so what is the importance of the current outreach of Japan to NATO? At what stage are we and what uh, are the possibilities of this connection, of this relationship? I mean, it's not for me to speak about NATO. I mm. mean, uh, uh, we are working very closely together, but still we are two distinct organizations, so I will uh, I will leave uh, uh, this to the uh, NATO colleagues. I understand that you will be hosting, uh, uh, Japan will be hosting uh, um, uh, in the coming days, I think the uh, Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg. Um, but, I mean, seen from, uh, let's say, a broader perspective, a broader security perspective, all the work that we can do together, including in the NATO context, is welcome. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you also increase uh, then uh, the day-to-day -day relations uh, with Japan in defense and security matters? I, I think the UMI wrote something about a hotline or something like this. I mean, I, I, and I think that it's, it's a little bit misinterpreted. I'm not speaking about uh, the hotline in terms of military uh, uh, terms. I was thinking about the fact that we are increasing our communication uh, with the, and, and our contacts with the uh, um, Japanese friends. And in order to do this, we are also trying to uh, uh, explore the uh, uh, possibility of creating a, a communication secure line between uh, uh, Brussels and Tokyo, as we have also with other uh, key partners. But it's not, again, a hotline. Eh? It's, uh, it's, um, physically an instrument to uh, uh, facilitate the contacts uh, 
Um, we have that. We do it now when we, when we need to do it. We go. I go to the uh, German uh, mm. emb- uh, to, sorry to the um, Japanese embassy in Brussels. Um, but the, I think that it's more practical if I can have something <laughs> in my own uh, building. So, so secure means uh, so that uh, the Russians, the Chinese, and the Americans can't listen in. And, uh, I mean, that the, in, in principle, uh, we can talk more freely. I mean, when you are on an open line, uh, uh, the risk of being uh, uh, heard uh, is very uh, substantial. When you are on a secure line, uh, it's uh, uh, you are much more protected, and so you can be more outspoken uh, uh, in the way you approach a number of uh, issues. So it's it's a pure, I would say, uh, technical tools eh, of communication. So I mean, uh, uh, because this has created some, uh, uh, maybe some misunderstanding about what we were doing. <laughs> okay. Other questions from the floor? No? Then I have another question. <laughs> I mean, we have time, so I will try to Absolutely. get as much out of you as possible. Um, Regarding uh, the, uh, the sec- your security assessment of Asia in a broader context, uh, not only Japan, but also um, Asia as a whole, East Asia, what are your biggest security concerns here in this region from the European point of view? Uh, our um, um, uh, concern is the, uh, how to say, uh, uh, I would say more our aim Uh, is to uh, preserve the uh, stability of the region and to preserve the uh, freedom uh, of uh, navigation and the uh, um, creation of uh, the the development of a space where uh, um, countries can uh, um, uh, work openly and freely uh, um, among themselves and being connected more with them the rest of the world, with the European Union in particular, that's the uh, work that we are doing through the, uh, our connectivity projects. So I would say more, uh, uh, I would put it more positively eh, in terms of uh, outlook, uh, but the idea, as I said, is the uh, preservation of the stability and of the openness uh, and of the freedom of the region. What role does trade and in interregional trade uh, in Asia play, I think especially of yeah, the very life, uh, of the very vibrant life of foreign uh, um, free trade zones here in Asia. Yeah? RCEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, is uh, uh, just uh, celebrated its first anniversary. So free trade in Asia is expanding. So what do you think of this development? And what? how can the un- EU benefit from these developments? Uh, well, we, uh, we, I would say uh, um, the European Union has always been a very strong supporter of, uh, um, of trade and free trade, and that's why we are developing a network of free trade agreements with a number of countries around the world, um, and that includes also um, um, uh, Southeast Asia, um, um, uh, Singapore, uh, uh, New Zealand, uh, Vietnam, Uh, now the negotiations uh, uh, that we are uh, um, um, uh, having with uh, Australia. Um, so there is a uh, the, the, the uh, economic partnership agreement with uh, with Japan. So there is a, uh, a very uh, strong and solid network of uh, um, of agreements. We have also uh, exploring the possibility of a free trade agreement with ASEAN complex, considering the complexity of the uh, um, the ASEAN region, but uh, this is a a key uh, part of the uh, uh, work that we are doing and that we want to to develop the uh, idea, uh, again, of uh, free trade. For us, it's a a driver for uh, uh, growth and for stability and for integration of communities. Mm. And uh, do you have any assessment about the different free trade agreements here in this area and how, what role they can play for the stability here in the region, like RCEP, like CPTPP? I, I, I think that, again, I mean, the, uh, the, the larger the network mm. and the more comprehensive the, the network, the, the better it is. And in any case, when you have a, a free trade agreement with one region, 
let's say, you um, extend the benefits almost naturally also to, uh, to other regions. So for us, the development of the, uh, this network is, uh, uh, is extremely uh, uh, important. And uh, that's why we want to uh, um, uh, enhance the work in, uh, uh, from this point of view. And uh, even when it comes to the uh, uh, economic security aspects, um, in, the, in the European Union, we have identified the component of the free trade agreements of one of the key elements of uh, uh, economic security. Mm. You mentioned negotiations with ASEAN countries. Uh, here in Asia, you sometimes hear that yeah, one hurdle are the relatively high demands uh, of the European Union in terms of labor issues, human rights issues, maybe environmental issues. Sometimes some people even say this is a kind of new protectionism uh, from Europe. So uh, how do you think uh, we can overcome these issues? Uh, all our work is um, um, based on a set of, um, of principles. Um, and I, I think that uh, as we have seen, for example, in, uh, in the green uh, uh, area, uh, the environmental standards uh, are essential if you want to preserve uh, our planet. Um, uh, I think that um, uh, we all have an interest to uh, uh, create, let's say, and to accept conditions uh, um, where, um, um, I don't know, we uh, um, authorize child labor or accept the idea of child labor. We are not, uh, let's say, inventing standards. We are just uh, applying uh, international standards that comes from the International Labor Organizations, Organization, the standards in the, uh, um, in the uh, uh, environmental uh, um, sector, um, because we think that trade has also to be sustainable. Um, and you, uh, otherwise it becomes predatory and the effect is that you are just uh, uh, drawing on the resources of uh, uh, a third country without creating wealth for everybody and uh, um, conditions for, for growth in, uh, in all countries. So um, um, I think that uh, um, as we are doing also in, uh, in, uh, in the connectivity sector. Uh, we are not putting conditions, but we are creating conditions for a sustainable growth. Um, and uh, uh, that's our uh, main uh, driver. Um, and I think that um, it, when it comes to trade, there is a, a reciprocal interest in, uh, in, uh, in moving in this uh, direction. After our trade agreements, normally speaking, I mean, the, uh, there is a uh, 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 growth of the GDPs of in, in, in on both sides, so it's a win-win, uh, uh, a win-win solution. Um, I think that uh, what we need to distinguish, uh, uh, if you uh, if you want to go into the uh, uh, the point of the protectionism, is we need to distinguish the idea of protecting, not of becoming protectionist, because it is true that uh, 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 the level playing field is something that needs to be uh, uh, ensured on both sides. Otherwise, uh, we run the risk that the openness of our societies is being abused by uh, 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 some countries. And I think that the, uh, uh, the work that uh, uh, we have been doing in the last few years when it comes to the uh, uh, um, uh, open strategic autonomy, the concept of uh, um, uh, the screening of the investments or the uh, movement uh, to uh, have anti-coercion measures, uh, it's uh, uh, important to uh, readdress uh, these imbalances and to create a, a level playing field. But again, I mean, uh, um, uh, we need to uh, uh, have in mind that uh, our efforts are not that of uh, um, creating uh, walls or barriers, but just, let's say, avoiding the ab abuses of our openness. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. We are
our time is almost up. I don't think we have to extend it. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, please give our guest uh, your hand. Thank you for, very much. For your answering all the questions. And um, yeah, it is, is common in our club. We also prepared a one year honorary membership. Ah. <laughs> As you said, that you like to come to Japan, maybe also on the in a private capacity, you are welcome to join us at the bar. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you. I think I will use it because I'm planning to come back. <laughs> Please.